Hello, everybody. So good afternoon or good evening. Um, I'm here to introduce our guest today for this perspective workshops of the Center for Artificial Intelligence here, so C4 AI for short. So our guest today is Professor Tommy Meyer, who's a full professor at Compu in computer science at the University of Cape Town and co-director of the South African Center for Artificial Intelligence Research. Um, before working in Cape Town, uh, Tommy uh, was for several years the director of the Maraca Center for Artificial Intelligence Research in Pretoria. And before that, he spent some time in Australia, in Wollongong and Sydney. And uh, before that, he did his PhD in Pretoria. Uh, and he finished more or less at the same time as I did. And this is when we met. <laughs> so Tom is a long going friend and colleague that we meet in all KR conferences for several years now. And it is a pleasure so to bring to have him here at the Center for AI. Thank you very much, Tommy, for coming and accepting our invitation. And the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Renata. Thank you very much. And also thank you for the invitation, um, for giving me the opportunity to, to give this presentation. So I'm going to switch over to my slides now, now that you know what I look like. There we go. And as you can see, um, my talk is going to be about AI, um, but it is mostly going to be about the sub area of AI known as knowledge representation. Um, or knowledge representation and reasoning. Um, but it's kind of in the age of machine learning. So I will be talking a little bit about um, machine learning as well. And I'll be looking at uh, links between KR and machine learning. So as Renata mentioned, I'm at the, uh, the University of, of Cape Town in the computer science department. And I'm a co-director of the Center for AI Research. I, I think at least in principle, this seems to be quite similar to your Center for AI. So I'm going to start off by just giving you a sense of what our center looks like. We're also we're always looking for various collabor collaboration and collaborative partners. So if you are interested in talking to us, um, please contact me afterwards. And as you'll see when I go to the next slide, even though my work is in knowledge representation and reasoning, I have quite a number of colleagues who work in other areas uh, of AI. So here's a picture of um, kind of a schematic uh, representation of, of our Center for AI Research. Um, so it is most, mostly funded by the South African Department of Science and Technology. It is run and managed from the University of Cape Town. So we have an, an AI research unit at the University of Cape Town and it's managed from there. So I, I co-manage it with, with a colleague of mine um, in computer science. We also have a center manager that, that helps us to run this. But then there's a whole bunch of research groups at different universities. So you'll see that there's a whole bunch of universities, the University of Cape Town and the University of Pretoria, the Western Cape, and a whole number of others there. Um, and at the different universities, we have research groups looking at specific areas um, of AI. You'll see that there in some universities there's more than one group, in others there's only one. This kind of grew organically over quite a number of years. Um, the main reason for the existence of the center, the center is actually 10 years old, so it's been around for quite a while. Um, it was much smaller when it started, but the reason was that frequently in the South African context at least, we have the problem that at a particular university, it's very hard, very hard to kind of build up critical mass in, in any area. The, the, the computer science departments are usually fairly small. And the whole idea of the center was to try and build up something where people can collaborate and, and coordinate. So the center is a fairly loosely organized organization. Um, so we, as I say, we manage it from Cape Town, but it's managing in a very loose sense of the word. Um, it's more getting people just to work together and to coordinate and get together and understand what, what the different groups are doing. 
I'm not going to say much more than that about the center at the moment. If you have questions, as I say, you can contact me afterwards, but you, also, you, can, you can also post questions um, towards the end of the talk about this, and, and I'll try to give you more information. Um, but what I like about the, the composition of the center is that it has both breadth and depth. So, so there are people working in specific areas, but it really covers a whole bunch of sub areas within artificial intelligence. So I'm going to leave the center um, or talk about the center there and then go, I'll go on um, into my talk. And of course, these days, when you talk about um, artificial intelligence, especially when you look in the media, there's frequently, um, to a large extent, something that can be viewed, in my view at least, as hype. Um, frequently, there are these discussions about super intelligent AI. So I'm going to give you one or two quotes about this. Um, and then afterwards, I'll, I'll give you my views on this before I start looking in more detail about um, and, 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 uh, looking into AI and, and knowledge representation specifically. Um, so here's Elon Musk, for example, and this was a couple of years ago already saying that uh, I think we should be very careful about AI. If I were to guess what our biggest existential threat is, it's probably that. So we need to be very careful. With AI, we are summoning the demons. Similarly, Bill Gates made a similar statement. Um, I'm in the camp that is concerned about superintelligence. I agree with Elon Musk and some others on this, and I don't understand why some people are not concerned. Now, on the one hand, one could argue that you, um, you know, these are people who know what they're talking about. Um, here's Bill Gates, for example, in 2015, giving a TED talk about the possibility of a pandemic involving a coronavirus. So this was, as I say, already in 2015. On the other hand, if you look at what Elon Musk is saying, and I'm not even referring to what's happening in the past two or three weeks ago with, with Twitter, but here's Elon Musk in 2020 saying that based on current trends, I mean, he was talking about COVID, here, probably close to zero new cases in the US too by the end of April. So the question is, which of these experts should one be listening to if they're acknowledged as experts in some way or another? Um, just another statement, um, here's Rodney Brooks, who um, was the director of the AI lab at MIT. Um, he says, on the other hand, that nothing could be further from the truth when we're talking about super intelligent AI. Almost all innovations in robotics and AI take far, far longer to be really widely deployed than people in the field and outside um, imagine. So having said that, and having talked about looked at these various options, I, I'll briefly tell you, I think, what I think as well as I go through the talk. But before I do that, um, I want to um, present here what I refer to as the Newcomb disclaimer. So Simon Newcomb was a Scottish mathematician who, in, on the 22nd of October 1903, made the following statement. He said, um, may not our mechanicians be ultimately forced to admit that aerial flight is one of the great class of problems with which man can never cope and give up all attempts to grapple with it. So essentially, he was saying, um, you know, in October 1903, that it's pointless to, to try and, and come up with manned flight. And here, of course, is the interesting thing. Less than two months later, um, we had the Wright brothers doing precisely what he said was not going to be possible. So my point is not... Um, that Newcomb is an idiot. In fact, he was a very accomplished mathematician, um, but more that it's very, very difficult to make um, predictions about what's going to happen in the future. So bear that, uh, bear that in mind as, as I give you my perspective on, on where, what, what AI is and, and, and where AI is going as well. And just to, to round this off as well, here much more recently is Stuart Russell making the following statement. He was saying, I think this was, again, two or three years ago, um, I agree that our general record of forecasting has been pretty dismal. I was remembering the futurist Ray Kurzweil recently saying how proud he was that he had predicted the self-driving car. I think he was saying this in 1996 or 1992, something like that. And he possibly wasn't aware that the first self-driving car was driving on the freeway in 1987, before he even thought to predict that such a thing might happen. So all of this simply to make this statement or, or to, to qualify things by saying, it, bear in mind that it is hard to make predictions. Having um, 
made those statements, let me then got, get into what exactly is artificial intelligence. So I'm not going to give you a definition of what AI is. What I'm rather going to do is I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Um, and, and you'll see as, as I continue why I think this is an instructive thing to do. So here's an example that goes back to the 18th century. Um, for those of you who don't know about this, this device was known as Mechanical Turk, and it was a chess playing machine. It turned out it, it, that it was actually pretty good, and people were really impressed with this. Um, but the way in which this worked is, if you, looked at, if you look at this little desk over there, um, is that there was someone sitting inside of that desk at the bottom there, and um, you know, pulling various um, levers and so on, and, and playing chess. Um, now, on the one hand, one could argue that this is fake, that it was not really a machine playing chess. On the other hand, you have to admire um, the ability of someone who could sit inside there and play a decent game of chess. So one could argue whether this is intelligence or not. Then I want to take you a little further um, into the 1960s um, and to look at what is really a version of automated um, psychotherapy. So what I have here on the slide is, uh, well, a, little, a, a console. And this was a, um, a little program called ELISA that was developed by Joseph Wiesenbaum, who was, I think, at that stage, the director of the MIT um, Computer Science Lab, something along those lines. So what this is, is a very simple little program that's run um, using a, a couple of fairly simple rules. Um, and apparently, and I don't know that much about psychology or psychotherapy, apparently it kind of mimics a Rogerian psychotherapist. So you ask it questions, um, or you converse with it, and it asks you questions. Now, Wiesenbaum apparently um, designed this little system precisely to indicate that it's really easy to fool people into thinking that something is intelligent. But rumor is that even though people knew that this was the case, they never, nevertheless fell for this and that they took this quite seriously. So the rumor is that his secretary took this quite seriously as a form of psychotherapy. Again, one could argue whether or not this is intelligence. And then I want to take you back, uh, not, well, I, I want to take you into the 1990s um, when, um, and, and the, the picture that I have on the slide here is that of the, the IBM machine Deep Blue who beat Kasparov and was really, I mean, that was really a milestone in, in AI history um, when for the first time a machine beat a human comprehensively when it came to chess. Now, the interesting thing about this is that um, when AI as, as a discipline um, was started in the 1950s or 60s, the prevailing opinion at that stage was that if one ever reached the point where a machine would consistently play, play better chess than a human, then we would really have achieved um, intelligence. Um, it turns out, for example, um, that Douglas Hofstadter, um, the author of the famous book Gödel Eschel Bach, in the 70s when he wrote the book, he was asked at some point whether he thinks that machines would ever play better chess than humans, and he said he doesn't think it's going to happen soon, but if it happens, his prediction was that then we would have achieved general AI intelligence. Um, so in, in that sense, he was spectacularly wrong. The, but the point, I, I, what I, the, the point that I want to make here is that even though in the, in the 60s, um, beating um, uh, humans at chess was regarded as a real litmus test for intelligence, when we actually got to this point, it wasn't so clear, um, there certainly wasn't consensus um, as to whether um, Deep Blue was really intelligent. Sure, it was very good at playing chess, but whether was it really intelligent? Then I want to take you into the middle of the 2010s when something similar happened with the game of Go. So even after um, uh, the, spect the spectacular successes um, that AI had with um, games such as, as chess, there was a feeling really until the early 2010s, I would say, um, that Go was really a different kettle of fish. So for those of you who don't know about the game, but I'm sure, you know, given all the hype a couple of years ago about um, AI and Go, you, you may certainly have heard um, about it um, since then. Um, the, the prevailing opinion in the early 2010s was that it would really need a qualitative shift 
in the way in which intelligent machines would go about to, um, to reach the point um, where machines would be better than humans. And nevertheless, it happened around the 2016s. And you know, since then, um, machines haven't really looked back um, as far as Go is concerned as well. So this brings us to the question, can machines think? Um, all of this kind of leading up to that. So, so here is um, someone named Jerome Wiesner, who's the special assistant to the US president for science and technology, who's saying that I suspect that if we come back in four to five years, I'll say, sure, machines really do think. Um, so given all of that, um, what is this current source of the excitement? Why are people going on about AI at the moment? And of course, I, my guess is that most of you would know what the answer is. And that is that, um, it's really the um, tremendous advances that have been made in machine learning in the past 5, 10, 15 years, and more specifically, deep learning. So um, my guess is that many people um, attending this talk will probably know more um, about deep learning than I do, so I'm not going to go into details. But I do want to make the following statement, and this is what I was kind of leading up to um, by looking at those various examples that I've given. In my view, and this is not something that I came up with on my own, um, definitely not, but this is shared, I think, by a number of AI researchers. The real surprise underlying deep learning is something that I think was articulated very well by Adnan Darwish, who said, again, this was a year or two, maybe three ago, um, the real surprise here is that some tasks that's typically associated with perception or cognition can be approximated to a reasonable extent by fitting functions to data. So in other words, the real surprise here is that whatever we use as litmus tests or think of as litmus tests for intelligence um, frequently can be dealt with um, by um, machines, um, but in ways that we do not necessarily think of as truly intelligent. Having said all of that um, and having given you a couple of examples of AI, what I now want to do is I want to look at AI as a discipline um, and where other areas other than machine learning can fit into this as well. So what I have on this slide here is the ACM computing classification system. So I know the ACM is currently working on an updated version of this. Um, as far as I know, there is a draft out, but this is the old one. So if you look at the ACM system um, and you go into computing methodologies, then within computing methodologies, you have Artificial intelligence, and interestingly enough, machine learning as a separate category, but when you go deeper into artificial intelligence, you have a whole bunch of areas. One of them being knowledge representation and reasoning. Um, so as the abstract to this talk also indicated, one of the points I want to make is that AI is broader than just machine learning. Um, and my area of, of, of interest and specialization is knowledge representation and reasoning. So for a big chunk of the remainder of the talk, I'm going to talk about knowledge representation and reasoning. And the, the idea is not to um, go into too much. In fact, there's very little detail that I'm going to give you. It's more to give you a flavor of some of the areas within knowledge representation and reasoning and, and what this actually is about. Okay, so what is knowledge representation or knowledge representation and reasoning? Here, I think, in a nutshell, is what it's about. It's finding appropriate ways of representing knowledge about some given domain of interest. So that's the first part. The first part is ensuring that you have appropriate ways to represent the knowledge that you have about it. And then secondly, developing methods to derive implicit consequences from explicitly represented information. And this is where the reasoning part comes in. So the first part is representing things in an appropriate way. Um, the second part is about extracting the information that's implicit in the information that is represented explicitly. You'll notice that the, this does not explicitly re, um, uh, deal with reasoning. In some sense, the, the assumption here is that when you have knowledge that there would be a way of, of, of acquiring it and, and re representing it appropriately. Which means, and I'll get to that a little bit later, that I think it makes sense to think about KR and, and machine learning as complementary and not as competing sub-disciplines sub of, of AI. It is worth noting that the dominant approach in KR is logic-based. That doesn't mean that everything is logic, 
Um, but it does mean frequently that um, even if you have various graphical representations, there frequently needs to be an underlying formal basis um, for doing whatever it is that you want to do when, when you get to the representation and the reasoning part. Um, and that even if you have other formalisms, you can usually recast them in a logic-based way. So in that sense, the dominant approach has been and, and is logic-based. So let me give you some very simple examples of what I mean by logic-based reasoning. And these are very high-level examples, um, but I'll go through various versions of such examples. So suppose, for example, that you know you have the following knowledge at your disposal. So as I say, this does not involve learning. We're assuming that we're getting this knowledge from somewhere. Suppose we know that birds fly, that birds have wings, that birds have four toes, and that robins are birds then um, I think it's, it's generally understood and agreed that some of the consequences from this basic knowledge that we represent in this way would be that we can conclude from this that robins fly. Why? Well, because robins are birds and birds fly. So there's a bit of information that's not explicitly represented, but that's kind of um, implicitly contained in the explicit knowledge that we have. Similarly, about robins having wings and so robins having four toes. It's essentially because robins are birds and birds have wings and have four toes. If we now go a little bit further and add to this explicit knowledge that we have that penguins are birds and that penguins don't fly, then, interestingly enough, one of the consequences we can get from this is that there are no penguins. So why is that the case? Well, if we know that birds fly and that penguins are birds, then from that it follows that penguins can fly. But if we also know that penguins don't fly, then we have what in some sense seems like a contradiction, but it's not entirely a contradiction. If we know that penguins fly and that they don't fly, that simply means that there can't be anything which has this property of being a penguin because, because otherwise it would simultaneously fly and not fly. And that means that there are no penguins. So this is fairly standard reasoning, I would say. Um, and these are fairly simple examples, but it's the only the reason I, I'm using these examples is to give you a sense of what I mean when I talk about drawing explicit or implicit consequences from explicitly represented information. Um, so the interesting thing about this from a KR or a knowledge representation perspective is that um, this form of reasoning is well understood. It can be formalized in appropriate ways. Um, and to a large extent, it can be dealt with and uh, via what is known as SAT solving. So SAT solving, um, for those of you who, who haven't encountered it before, is really just a matter of looking at truth tables. And I would imagine that most of you have seen truth tables at some point, maybe in your undergraduate career. So truth tables um, are simply a scenario where you have a number of Boolean variables and you can combine them in various ways. And when it comes to the SAT part in SAT solving, that refers to satisfiability. And all that that really means is that there is, um, we look at the problem of checking whether um, a Boolean formula, a formula um, consisting of, of various Boolean variables, whether there is a way to make it true if you assign truth values to this. The point being the following. The kind of reasoning that I'm talking about in knowledge representation and reasoning in many cases can simply be reduced to SAT solving, checking whether a formula is satisfied, whether there is a way to make a formula true or not. Um, so as I say, that's fairly well understood. Um, well, at, at least in the, the principles are well understood. Um, but of course, from a computational perspective, there are issues to be dealt with. What do I mean by that? Well, on the previous slide, I had an example in which there were two Boolean variables. Let's say P and Q. If we have two Boolean variables, then there are four rows in our truth table, and then we can very easily check whether one of them um, assigns um, uh, the value to a formula that, that is true. In the bird example, which I, which I didn't for, uh, formalize, um, but which can easily be formalized, I had six Boolean variables. Um, and that means we have 2 to the power of 6 or 64 rows in our truth table, which is already a bit more, but it's certainly possible to deal with. But the issue there is that um, there's a combinatorial um, um, explosion there, or an exponential explosion. 
Um, which means that as the number of Boolean variables grow, checking satisfiability becomes really hard. In fact, set solving viewed as such is intractable, um, and it's well known that the satisfiability problem is, is an incomplete problem. Nevertheless, modern set solvers can handle problems with, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of Boolean variables, which doesn't mean that they can solve all problems with such, um, with such large numbers of Boolean variables, but that one can, the, the, the argument or the point here is that one can frequently exploit the structure of formulas or problems or knowledge bases, in other words, the knowledge that one has available to be able to deal with large problems. In the worst case, you might still run into problems. Um, but similarly to many of the um, astonishing advances in machine learning, there have been astonishing advances in set solving in the past 10 to 20 years. If you go back 10, 20, 20 years um, and you would have asked um, set solving researchers at that point whether it was possible to handle the number of Boolean variables that can be handled at present, they would have laughed at you and said it's not, it, it won't be possible to do this in 10 to 15 years. So there has been a resolution or a revolution in, in this sense as well. Okay, so I've talked a bit about set solving and, and general reasoning. <clears throat> then I want to give you another example about reasoning, which is slightly different from what we've seen so far, and that's reasoning about knowledge. And possibly the easiest way <clears throat> to, to look at this is um, to look at a very simple example of a problem that's known as the, the muddy children problem. So the scenario is the following, for those of you who haven't encountered this before. We have three little children, in this case, three little boys that I have on the slide up here. And um, the first, the, the one on the left, the one in the, and, and the one on the middle have mud on their faces, and then the one on the right doesn't have mud on his face. So the scenario that we're dealing with here is the following. We have an adult looking at the three boys and telling them that at least one of you, he's speaking to the boys and he's saying, at least one of you has mud on, 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 your, on, on your face. And, then he, and, and there's an assumption here that, that the adult is, is, is speaking the truth. He asks um, the three boys then, do you know whether you have mud on your face? Now, initially all three boys would say, no, they don't know. And the argument here is simply that if any one of them looks at the other two, the assumption is that they can see the other two, but not the mud on their own faces. If they look at the other two, they'll see that there's at least one of the other two having mud on their face. Um, and therefore, they wouldn't know, given the information that they've been given so far, whether they have mud on their own faces. But, and here's the interesting thing. Once they've answered initially and said, all three of them said no, if they are asked again, do you know whether you have mud on your face? Then it's possible for the first boy to say yes, and it's possible for the second one to say yes. For the third boy, it's still not possible to do so. And I'm not going to go through this in hordes of detail because it's more the principle that's important, but, but let's just look at the first two boys. So here's the argument. The first boy could argue, it follow, uh, could, could argue as follows. He could say, um, suppose I didn't have mud on my face. If I didn't have mud on my face, then when the middle boy looked at the two of us, the remaining two, he would only have seen two boys without mud on their faces. So when he was initially asked the question, do you have mud on your face? He would have said yes, but he said no. And therefore, I can't, it can't be the case that I don't have mud on my face. And that means that I must have mud on my face. The second boy could argue use exactly the same argument, and therefore he would say yes. The third boy would still be um, in the dark about whether this is the case, but, and this I don't have on the slide, if we go on for another round, if, if, he, if they're again asked after this, do you know whether you have mud on the, your face, the third boy could, would be able to argue that he now knows whether or not he has mud on his face, and in this case he would correctly be able to, to say that he doesn't. So the argument about all of this, or the reason I'm bringing this example up, is it's still about reasoning. But you'll notice that this is a slightly different type of reasoning than um, in the previous, the, the bird example, for example, uh, that I gave. Because over here, um, the, the kids were arguing about the knowledge that um, the other kids have, and, and their own knowledge as well. So. Um, this is an area known as dynamic epistemic logic. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into the details here, except to say that it's well understood what it means to reason with and about knowledge. 
which in some sense goes a little further than just knowledge, reasoning about knowledge that you have about the world. Um, then I'm going to shift to another form of, um, or a sub area of knowledge representation, which is known as defeasible reasoning. Um, I'll say a little bit more about this than about the others, because this is an area in which I work. So it's something that I find interesting. Um, and in order to explain what this is about, um, I'm going to go back to the birds. Okay, so um, as we've seen um, a little earlier, if I know that birds fly, that they have wings, that they have four toes, that robins are birds, that penguins are birds, and that penguins don't fly, I made the case a little earlier that one would then be able to conclude that there are no penguins. So if you use um, the accepted form of what it means for um, something to logically follow, from something else, you would be able to come to the conclusion that there are no penguins. And strictly speaking, this is correct. But I would argue that if we look at what happens in the real world, this is problematic. And the reason this is problematic is because when we say things such as that birds fly, what we probably mean is not that birds fly, but that they usually, usually fly. And that in some sense, we'd like to, to, to be able to deal with exceptions. So I would argue that one should take this knowledge base, in other words, this set of statements that I have over here, and in a real world scenario, it probably makes more sense to, to translate them into these statements, that birds usually fly, that birds usually have wings, that they usually have four toes. One could probably make an argument that statements four and five should be strict statements or classical statements, so they're kind of definitional almost. Robins are birds and penguins are birds. But again, in statement number six, um, one could probably, what, what's probably meant is that penguins usually don't fly. So I don't want to spend too much time arguing, you know, the benefits uh, or, or whether, let's say, statements four and five ought to be, ought to have usual in their statements as well. The, the question here is more that if we look at classical logic, the logic of propositional logic or Boolean logic, it's not possible at all to talk about usually. So I'm making a case here for a richer logic where it's possible for you to make both classical statements, such as that robins are birds, as well as more fuzzy statements, qualitatively fuzzy statements that, that would make the claim, a claim such as birds usually fly. And the point of the feasible reasoning then is to figure out how one ought to be able to reason with such um, with, 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 with defeasible statements such as these. For example, if I have the set of statements that I've just given you, that birds usually fly, that they usually have wings, that they usually have four toes, robins are birds, penguin, and penguins are birds, and that penguins usually don't fly, then I would argue that for any reasonable form of reason, of defeasible reasoning, given that information, one should be able to conclude that robins usually fly that robins usually have wings and that robins usually have four toes. And the argument would be that, well, if we know that it's, these things are usually properties of birds and that a robin is a bird, then it's kind of a, a, a very prototypical bird and there's no reason not to be able to draw these conclusions, that robins can then usually fly. In other words, that they inherit these properties. On the other hand, if we ask similar questions about penguins, it's not quite so clear exactly what the answers should be. So given those first six statements, I would argue that if we look at the first one, um, if we ask whether penguins usually fly, the answer should be no. Penguins usually don't fly. And the argument would be that even though penguins are birds and that birds usually fly, the argument would be that the direct statement that penguins usually don't fly should override the more general statement that penguins are birds and, and birds usually fly. On the other hand, if we look at the other two statements, one can go in two different directions. The statements about whether penguins usually have wings and whether penguins usually have four toes. So there are at least two different ways to look at this. The one is frequently refers to, uh, referred to as presumptive reasoning. And here's the argument underlying presumptive reasoning. The argument says that if I'm told something, then unless I get explicit information to the contrary, I should hold to it. So for example, since I know that penguins are birds and that birds usually fly, 
uh, sorry, since I know that penguins are birds and that birds usually have wings, there's nothing that really contradicts this information. And therefore, I should hold, um, I, sh I should be able to conclude that penguins usually have wings. Similarly, about four toes, since I know that birds usually have four toes and that penguins are birds, penguins should inherit this property of having four toes. So that's one way of looking at it. But there's a slightly different way of looking at it as, as well. That is frequently referred to as prototypical reasoning. Here the argument is as follows. It says that you should stick to prototypes, and if you deviate from a prototype, um, then it's not really clear that what you're talking about inherits the, these properties. So in this case, even though we know that um, birds usually have wings and that birds usually have four toes, the argument is that, well, we know a penguin is not a typical bird because it doesn't fly. And the argument with prototypical reasoning then is saying that since it's not a typical bird, we don't necessarily, or we shouldn't necessarily uh, ascribe these other properties that typical birds have, that they have wings and four toes, to penguins. My point over here is not to try and convince you that either presumptive reasoning or prototypical reasoning is one of them is the correct way of, do, of, of, of reasoning. The point is that they both seem to be reasonable reasonable ways of, of drawing conclusions and that it would really depend on the context um, to determine how which one you would you would want to use. So this is slightly different from classical reasoning, classical logical reasoning, where there's a specific way, um, a, 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 an accepted way of, of looking at drawing um, consequences. To give you one simple example of where the context here would make it would, would help us to determine which one we should use. Take the case of a crime that's being committed. Um, one could argue that um, if the police are looking for who actually committed the crime, they should use a version of presumptive reasoning because they need to be more adventurous um, in coming up with possible suspects. But that once they've gathered some evidence and you take this to court, um, that in the scenario of a court, it makes perhaps more sense to look at prototypical reasoning where one needs to be a bit more conservative in terms of jumping to conclusions. Uh, the argument in the end being that it, there's, there seems to be more than one way of drawing conclusions the moment you enrich your knowledge representation language with defeasible information. In other words, this idea of talking about usual. And note, by the way, that everything that I've said so far indicates that we're talking about qualitative versions of defeasibility. I'm talking about usually. So I'm not assigning probabilities or something along those lines to, to statements. Um, it's possible in principle to do that, but, um, and, and I'm not knocking any way of, of, of doing that. They, they, those ways of reasoning certainly are reasonable ways to do so as well. Um, but there is a case to be made for qualitative reasoning um, as well, um, qualitative defeasible reasoning. Okay, so, to sum up then, um, or to summarize at least at the moment, defeasible reasoning is an ongoing area of research at the moment. The goal is something that I think Douglas Adams in a slightly different context actually um, de defined very well. The goal of defeasible reasoning in some sense is to demand rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty because the moment we're talking about defeasibility, defeasibility we are talking about cases where there are doubts and uncertainty and exceptions but we want to define this appropriately and, 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 and formally so that we can reason with it using machines. So it's an ongoing area of research. As I've just shown you, there are different modes of defeasible reasoning. I've shown you two, and there are many other ways as well. Um, in some contexts, it's, the interesting thing is that this can be reduced to set solving. In other words, another way of saying this is that it can be reduced to classical reasoning which from a computational perspective is very useful. There's some translation to be done, but it basically means that if you have a highly efficient SAT solver, then you can have a highly efficient um, feasible reasoner as well. So much of, most of what I've said so far um, was based on Boolean logic or propositional logic, but it's worth pointing out um, that the feasible reasoning goes beyond Boolean or propositional logic. Um, two logics such as first order logic and description logic. So 
the example I have over here is a very informal one, but it's simply intended to indicate that in some cases where you need to go beyond what can be presented in a Boolean logic, it is possible to do so. So the example simply says the following. Um, if heads of department, well, it makes the statement that, that heads of departments are lecturers. This is in a university, university environment, not surprisingly. Heads of departments don't have a lecturer as a line manager. Lecturers usually have a line manager that is a head of department. Heads of departments are usually responsible. Lecturers are usually overworked. And then we can ask the questions, are heads of department usually overworked and do lecturers usually have responsible line managers? The point simply being that if you look at these statements, some of them cannot be represented appropriately in a Boolean logic, a classical Boolean logic, but they can be represented in some um, description logics as well. If you, if you don't know what a description logic is, don't worry too much about this. The point is simply that it's a logic in which you can express more than you can in, in, than in, in standard Boolean or proposition logics. Okay, so that was my very brief summary of knowledge representation um, and one or two or three areas um, within knowledge representation and reasoning. What I want to do for the remainder of my talk is look a little bit at um, the interaction between KR and, and machine learning. And again, this is going to be a high level description, um, uh, but I, I will use some examples to, to point out where I think these two areas can actually be quite usefully used together to come up with better solutions to problems. So I think it's fairly uncontroversial to say that machine learning is good at <laughs> learning, you know, hence the name. It's also the case that KR is kind of aimed at drawing conclusions, as I've just shown you. And I know I've shown you very simple examples, but to a large extent, the point of knowledge representation and reasoning is reasoning to be able to draw conclusions. It also turns out, um, and I think this is very, fairly well known at the moment, that most ML tools tend to be fairly opaque. So um, one could think of them as black boxes, where it's kind of hard to get a sense of exactly how the learning that, that you've made use of um, can be good to put, put to good use. Whereas KR tools tend to be quite transparent. In other words, they can be viewed as glass boxes. So what do I mean by that? I'm going to give you one example. And this and, and one, ex one simple example is a version of explanation. It turns out that frequently when you have a machine learning model, it's not that easy to explain conclusions that you can draw from that. But in some cases, one can in some sense get the best of both worlds. It turns out that at least some machine learning classifiers can be compiled into what are essentially Boolean formulas. Now, it turns out that Boolean formulas can be compiled into what is known as Boolean circuits. The best way to think of a Boolean circuit is really just a, a compressed um, and a, um, a, a fairly compact way of representing the same information that you have um, in a Boolean formula. And it turns out that Boolean circuits can be used for explanation. And I'll go through an example to show you what I mean by that. So what I have here on the slide, on the right-hand side, is a Boolean formula that is compiled into what is known as an ordered binary decision diagram. So you should think of the, uh, the little ovals that I have over here as the Boolean variables. So they can be either true or false. And the dotted lines indicate when they're false and the, the solid lines indicate when they're true. So for example, in this case, we want to find out whether um, an applicant is supposed to be denied admission or admitted into, let's say, a program. It's a graduate or an undergraduate program, or whatever the case might be. So the information we have in here simply basically says the following. We need to look at what the values are of the different Boolean variables, and then it's going to lead to either an admit or a deny. So for example, if a candidate um, passed the entrance exam, that means this will be true. If it's a first um, time applicant, then it means we go down this road to work experience. Um, and if it has work experience, then it will, will be admitted. On the other hand, if it doesn't have work experience, it takes us to GPA. In other words, what the GPA value uh, uh, score was, and what the candidate's GPA score was. If it's good enough, then it will go to an admit, then it's a true. And if it's not good enough, if it's a fail, then it will go to deny. And similarly, you can go through all the other options over here. So why am I saying that this can be used for explanation? Well. Let's take a specific example. Suppose we have a student or a potential student who's passed the entrance exam. 
Okay, so we can start in, with entrance exam and go to first time applicant. It's a first time applicant, so we can go from that to work experience. Um, they have no work experience, so we go to GPA, but they have a high GPA, so that means this takes us to admit. So such a student would then be admitted. And here's an explanation or a reason for admission. Um, I'm claiming that the reason in, of, for admission is really based on just these two Boolean variables, that they pass the entrance exam and that they have a high GPA. So I'm saying that as long as those two things are true, they will be admitted. It's relatively easy to see this if you go through, through, um, through, through the OBDD that I have here. So for example, since they passed the entrance exam, we go to first time applicant, um, then if they're not a first-time applicant, then they're going to be admitted anyway. If they are a first-time applicant, well, then there are two options. They either have work experience or not. If they have work experience, they're going to be admitted anyway. If they don't, but they have a, a high GPA, they will be admitted. So this is a good explanation. Um, uh, an explanation in this sense means that we're boiling it down to really the, the core of, of, of what is necessary for someone to be able to, to, to be admitted into the program. I can slightly extend this um, example by adding in another Boolean variable, in this case, rich hometown. The argument being that this will be true if a candidate comes from a rich hometown. And again, if we look at a particular case of a student for which these Boolean variables are true, if they pass the entrance exam and they're a first time applicant, but they have no work experience, it goes to GPA. If they have a high GPA, then admit it. If they don't have a high GPA, but they come from a rich hometown, they will be admitted as well. So firstly, the reason for admission in this case was they passed the entrance exam and that they have a high GPA. That's fairly easy to see. I'm not going to go through the details now. But more interestingly, one could um, ask a what is really a counterfactual question here. And that is that suppose they didn't have a, a high GPA. From the information that we have here, we can conclude that they will be admitted even without a high GPA. And the reason would be because they are from a rich hometown. And this is information that is really inherent in the, OBD, uh, the OBDD we have here. So it, it's, it's essentially asking counterfactual questions. It's a form of explanation of, of what's going to or what could happen. And this then brings me to um, the fact that in many cases, we can identify biases. So what do I mean by bias? Well, it turns out that you can make bias decisions because some Boolean variables are protected. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a specific example. If we look at this example at the OBDD that we have over here, um, it turns out that the admission decision, whether to admit someone or not, um, will differ for two candidates who differ just on rich hometown. So that means that there is bias in here. The, the rich um, hometown Boolean variable based on this indicates a version of bias. Now, note, by the way, that bias is not necessarily a bad thing. In the case of, you know, <laughs> rich hometown being a determining factor, that certainly is the case. Um, but perhaps entrance exam. Um, could be a biased Boolean variable as well. But that may well be precisely because we want this to be the differentiating factor. The important part here is that in extracting or, or encoding the information in this way, it's possible to identify these um, Boolean variables that correspond to biases. And then one can look at those and figure out whether you want them to be um, biased Boolean variables or not. If they are unwanted, such as the rich hometown one, um, the idea would be that one would um, that the, the, the information that you've learned and from which you've compiled this OBDD is problematic, and then you can do something about it. Okay, so that was my brief foray into the potential for um, uh, collaboration, if you like, or complementary work being done in knowledge representation and machine learning. So I'm coming to the end of, of my talk at the moment. Um, I want to go back to uh, what AI is and whether machines can think. So yes, Stuart Russell again, being fairly optimistic about the future of AI, but making a point, oh, uh, 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 and in my view, an important point about going beyond just one sub area, such as machine learning, when it comes to AI. 
Um, and again, this was a year or two ago, Stuart Russell saying, I would say that language understanding, at least in a simplified sense, will become possible in this decade. So you know, it's a sub area of AI. And I think it will be a combination of deep learning with probabilistic um, programming with Bayesian and symbolic methods. Symbolic methods being uh, knowledge representation and reasoning to a large extent. The, the point here being that I think it's important not to neglect some of the sub areas of AI, but make sure that as we continue, we retain expertise in all of these areas to ensure that, that artificial intelligence can really reach what it's supposed to reach. And then I want to come back to this question of whether machines can think. So you may remember that I referred to J Jerome Wiesner, who is the special assistant to the US president for science and technology, who said that if we come back in four to five years time, I'll say, sure, they really do think. Now, it's true that Jerome was the special assistant to the US president for science and technology, but that was a while ago. So I have a small video here that I'm going to show you, and I hope this works. The thinking machine. Hello again. With me tonight is Professor Jerome B. Wiesner, director of the research laboratory of electronics at MIT. Dr. Wiesner, what really worries me today is what's going to happen to us if machines can think. And what interests me specifically is, can they? Well, that's a very hard question to answer. If you'd asked me that question just a few years ago, I'd have said it was very far-fetched. And today, I just have to admit, I don't really know. I suspect if we come back in four or five years, I'll say, sure, they really do think. Well, if you're confused, Doctor, how do you think I feel? We're OK, so the point of this is simply that, you know, We've been talking about whether machines can think for a very long time, and it brings me back to um, what uh, Adnan Dawish's statement um, about the real surprise underlying deep learning. And then I want to leave you with my last slide, which again speaks to this point. So this question of whether machines can think and, and whether AI has really reached some, some level of intelligence, um, the correct answer, I think, or the co correct response to this is the one that Etzger Dijkstra gave quite a number of years ago, and that is that the question of whether machines can think is about as relevant as the question of whether submarines can swim. The point being that we should really think of it in a slightly different way. So that's the end of my slides, or the end of my talk. Let me see. I'm going to close this, and then I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So thank you very much, Tommy. Um, very uh, interesting, stimulating talk. Uh, so we'll see if people want to post uh, questions uh, in the YouTube chat. But meanwhile, I have one question, which is um, when you talk about the machine learning classifiers that can be encoded, um, in Boolean formulas, do we know which ones? Do we, we know which class of 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 the algorithms, the classifiers that can be encoded, and how hard it is to encode? Can we guarantee to have this beautiful short uh, <laughs> OBDB? Yeah, and of course the answer to that. So, so there is a class. Um, I, I I don't know that much about specifically that area, um, but it is a subclass. Um, it, it's certainly not not all of, of the machine learning models. Um, and even then, you know, the, the question of whether you're going to have really nice compact representations is an open question. Um, there's also, of course, the question of whether um, I mean there are other forms of explanation as well. So my my um, my, my goal and, and my point of bringing that particular um, uh, version up is, is, is firstly because it's something that I'm interested in, but I think it's representative of the broader point that there are many areas in which um, or where machine learning and KR as well as other areas of, of AI can be combined. Um, and again, not only machine learning and, and other areas of AI there are many areas or, or many examples and many domains where the different pillars of AI can be successfully used together. 
to come up with with appropriate and better solutions in in the end, um, rather than just looking at at a specific at, at a specific sub area within AI. Thanks. We have a question coming from YouTube from Arnaldo Candido Jr. He's asking whether, well, he's mentioning that there is progress in deep learning for solving sad problems. And what are your views and on this approach? Yeah, a, a, a nice one. Of course, there's progress in many areas in, in deep learning, um, getting solving some, some areas, some, some of those problems. Um, my views on this, I think, is similar to looking at most other problems um, where deep learning has been really successful. It seems that over and over again, what seems to happen is you reach a particular point with some of the progress in deep learning, and then there's a gap. Then there's a problem, and it seems to be really hard to go beyond that, um, and that it's useful to, um, yeah. to combine different methods to, to go beyond that. So I think it, it goes back to my point of not... Um, or making sure that all the different sub areas of, of, of AI are um, still taught properly and understood properly so that we can get an overall better understanding. Um, maybe just a, a, another version of a response to this. Um, if you look at the various approaches to solving Go, for, for example, so, so Alpha Go and Alpha Zero and so on, most or many people think of these as, as deep learning solutions um, to solving the Go problem, but it's actually a repertoire of various AI techniques, which certainly involves machine learning, but it involves a whole bunch of other AI techniques as well. And I think it's a very good example of precisely this, that it's important to, to, to look at everything that's been learned in, in AI and to ensure that expertise in all those areas remain. Um, again, if in, and, and, and an example going back maybe 20 or 30 years, when it seemed at some point that um, neural net that, that research in neural networks reached a kind of peak, and there was a feeling that maybe um, you know it's it's not worth pursuing, it would have been a terrible disaster if this had not continued because then we would not have had the revolution we've had in deep learning at the moment. But I think the same lesson applies to m all of the other areas within AI as well. So a bit of a long-winded question uh, answer to your question. Mm -hmm. So I hope it Thank you. Uh, there's a question by Fernando Osorio about using Boolean formulas and decisions uh, so that it looks like coming back to decision trees, yes? yes. <laughs> and how, how do you see the, the possibilities of integrating these approaches? Uh, well, again, I mean, there are many different ways of, of trying to, to, to integrate them. Um, so the the example it's certainly the case, and I think I, I think this relates to what you were asking as, as well, Renata. So I, the example I had is a fairly simple one, um, uh, and of course the reason I use that is because it's easy to understand in a, in a talk that lasts you know fifty minutes or so. But it's it's more indicative of the question of looking at, at various ways of, of combining um, these different approaches, and certainly it goes beyond just decision trees. I completely agree. Thanks. Uh, so Fabio Cosman is asking about <laughs> possibilities of collaboration between South Africa and Brazil. Uh, yes, I, I certainly see the possibility for that. Um, uh, it's, as you know, <laughs> we, we are both in BRICS. Um, and, and I know that in some cases there are possibilities um, through BRICS during the COVID years, they, there was a little bit of a, a lull there. Um, but I certainly from speaking from the perspective of the, you know, I'm wearing different hats here. You know, on the one hand, I'm a, I'm a KR researcher, but I'm also, as I mentioned, the co-director of, of the Center for AI Research. As the co-director of, 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 uh, of CARE, I'm very um, interested in pursuing this. Um, of course, as a KR researcher, um, I'm certainly interested in pursuing this as well. But my point is that if, if, K, if KR isn't necessarily your thing, um, if you go back to my initial slide or my second slide, you'll see that we really cover a whole bunch of areas within AI, ranging from the ethics of AI, uh, you know, philosophy and the ethics of AI, right through to applications of machine learning, 
um, and, and KR and so on included as well. So I'm very keen to, to discuss further collaboration between South Africa and Brazil. And maybe just a quick little plug for those of you who don't know, uh, next year, the International Joint Conference on AI, Ichikai, will be held in Cape Town. Um, the, it's in August next year. The submission date for the conference is in the middle of January, but we plan a whole number of, of events co-located with that as well. So that might be a very good time to talk in person about <laughs> collaboration as well. If, and, but of course, it would be nice to, to, to do this online before that as well. Great, thanks. Um, we have a, a question from Elio Ferenhoff, but it relates to several comments he had before. So I'm trying to, to... So he was asking about provisions of models to deal with, to deal with issues of knowledge waste, knowledge leakage, knowledge loss, knowledge spillover, uh, mapping the core knowledge. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I, I think maybe if, if I understand this correctly, the, the question is, is about, um, to a large extent, about knowledge acquisition. If you, if you acquire knowledge, how do you ensure that, 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 that you have something reasonable there? Um, and it's certainly the case that, that from the KR perspective, KR doesn't have that much to say about that aspect. For quite a number of years, there's been an assumption in the KR community that we're assuming that we have knowledge that, um, that is reasonable, um, and the focus is more on the representational mechanisms um, and then on the reasoning beyond that. Uh, and uh, earlier this year, we, we had a, a doctoral seminar about precisely this point, and the general feeling in the KR community is that this is a gap. There needs to be more um, focus from the KR perspective as well on knowledge acquisition and acquiring knowledge. Now, um, that's not to say that KR needs to or wants to uh, reinvent what has been done in, in other areas. Um, it's more a statement of intent um, to work more closely with areas that where this has been an issue um, uh, or, or with the, this has been an area of focus. But I, I certainly agree that it's, you know, it, it's the old thing, right? It's garbage in, garbage out. You can have wonderful representational mechanisms and fantastic reasoning um, algorithms. But if the knowledge you get in, if the information that you would need to use to drive this is not of, of, of good value, then it's a problem. And I think KR can certainly contribute to that, um, to, to the solution of the problem. If you look at various versions of explanation that can help to figure out where problems lie as well. But it's, it, what it needs is a more collaborative way within the, the broader AI community to look at the problem. So I, I hope that that um, answers your question to some extent. And we have one question, comment actually by Igor, uh, saying that uh, some people counter the arg argument that, that AI is, well, that machine learning is just approximating functions by arguing that actual intelligence is also just approximating functions. So, we would like to hear your perspectives on this. Line yes, uh, I, I think it's, it's a really interesting question because um, it, it, a lot of what, what I've been saying, I think, talks about precisely that, right? There's, there seems to be um, this constant almost shifting of the goalposts, you know, saying that... Um, if we reach some particular point, you know, if, if there's a machine that plays chess well enough, or if there's a machine that plays Go well enough, um, then we would have reached intelligence, true intelligence. And then when we reach it, people are saying, well, it's really just approximating something in some way. Um, I know a similar statement was made immediately after um, the, the um, AlphaGo uh, uh, was successful in, in, in beating what was then, I guess, the current um, Go championship. It was immediately a statement saying, oh, okay, but this is a game where there's perfect information. You, you know what the information is. Um, something like poker um, is a completely different ball game. You're not going to be able to do that. And within two years, um, a group from CMU had this program that beat the world's best um, poker players. Um, and again, the same point was being made. So I, I, 
I think it depends on exactly what one would want out of this in the end. On the one hand, yes, it's all just approximating functions in some way or another. But I do think that there is a difference between just looking at the data and learning from the data and um, approximating a function from that and building something that looks like a, a model of the world. Um, there, I think, is a, diff a, 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 a bit of a difference there. The argument there is that data on its own is not sufficient, that you need to inject it with something else that really would give an agent a model of the world. Um, and certainly you can learn part of this by making use of data. So um, I would then, Igor, I, I, would, I would agree that it's, it's a bit simplistic to say that just everything is, is the approximation, is, is approximating functions. Um, but this idea of building a model of the world, I think, is a core one and, and, and one that is advocated by a, 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 a whole number of people with, within the AI community. And I think that's where the difference lies. Thanks, Tommy. Um, well, I see there are no further questions here. Uh, so I'd like to thank you again in the name of the Center for AI. Hope you manage to come and visit us in person at some point. And otherwise, we'll meet next time, next KR, <laughs> if not each guy. <laughs> Thank you very much, Renata. I'm, I'd be very happy to come and visit, um, and I hope to see many of you um, at, at Ichikai in, in, in August next year. Um, as I say, it's, it's the conference, but we're planning a, a whole bunch of co-located events as well. So please, um, as they say, watch the space. And thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks, everybody, for watching. <laughs>